Good morning and welcome virtually to the Center for Constitutional Studies at Utah Valley University in Orem, Utah. I'm Scott Paul. I serve here as, in the center as interim director and executive director. Speaking on behalf of my colleagues, we are thrilled to spend these two days with you considering pressing issues of religious liberty and how these issues may be affected by the new US Supreme Court. I extend a special welcome to the high school classes that are joining us today. Two years ago, the Center for Constitutional Studies launched a K-12 constitutional literacy initiative, which includes, among many other things, bringing high school students to campus for special sessions of our conferences. Since the students can't come to, conference, to campus, uh, we've invited our high school friends to join us online uh, for this session and for the first session tomorrow. Uh, there'll be specially designated K-12 outreach sessions. Now, please, Allow me a few words of introduction and acknowledgement. Organized in 2011, the Center for Constitutional Studies is a nonpartisan academic institute that promotes the instruction, study, and research of constitutionalism. Our mission is to increase constitutional literacy in our local, state, and national communities in a nonpartisan manner. We pursue this mission in a multidisciplinary fashion to effectively equip a new generation of citizens and leaders with the broad understanding that is critical to the perpetuation of constitutional government, ordered liberty, and the rule of law. Speaking on behalf of my colleagues, I express gratitude to UVU Provost, Dr. Wayne Bott, and UVU President, Dr. Astrid Tamines, for their support of our center. I also thank the members of our advisory board for their invaluable guidance. Several of them were especially helpful in developing this conference. We hope that this is the last conference we will hold entirely online for many reasons, not the least of which is that you miss out on engaging with the amazing UVU students here in the center. Thanks to the generous support of the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Utah Federalism Commission, and especially the Wood family, the center is home to more than 20 phenomenal student research assistants. They are truly the lifeblood of our organization. This opening session of our conference will set the stage on the current state of religious liberty in the United States and also consider the new uh, US Supreme Court. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce you to the moderator of this session, Dr. Nicholas Cole. He is a senior research fellow at Pembroke College at the University of Oxford. Dr. Cole is a longtime and dear friend of the Center for Constitutional Studies so I hope he will indulge me when I present him to you as a 21st century superhero. By day, he is a brilliant yet mild-mannered American historian, but by night, he transforms into a caffeine-fueled world-class computer coder. He's combined his academic superpowers to create the Quill Project, an award-winning groundbreaking software platform that creates interactive visual and textual models of the constitutional conventions and the congressional debates that produce our nation's governing documents. Dr. Cole, thank you for joining us today. Scott, it's a huge, huge honor to be here and, and to be moderating this opening panel. Um, just, a, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, this is a, a panel of two speakers uh, and the, the they're both give presentations and that will be followed by a question and answer session and we'd, we'd really invite our viewers to submit questions via the, the comment section on the youtube channel or by emailing constitution at uvu.edu and with that it's my duty to introduce the the two speakers um the first is professor stephanie berkeley a first amendment scholar who researches and teaches about the role of our different demo or your i should say i'm speaking from britain uh democratic institutions play in protecting minority rights particularly at the intersection of free speech and religious exercise issues she's been published widely in legal journals and um prior to teaching uh was uh sorry uh, litigated first amendment cases full-time at the beckett fund for religious liberty where she represented many organizations and individuals at both the trial and appellate level, including before the US Supreme Court. She's
She's twice been named a Washington DC superstar rising uh, super, super lawyer rising star for 2016 and 2019 and has been nominated to serve as director of programs for the ALLS law and religious section and was a subcommittee chair for the JRCLS International Religious Freedom Committee. She's clerked for the Honorable N. Randy Smith on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit and was recently selected to serve as a law clerk to U.S. Supreme Court Justice Neil Gorsuch. It's an honor to have her with us. Um, The second speaker will be Mark Walsh. He's a reporter specializing in coverage of the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, Walsh writes the Supreme Court column a report column for the ABA Journal, the, the magazine of the American Bar Association, and is a regular contributor to SCOTUS blog, a website devoted to coverage of the Supreme Court. For that website, Walsh writes the View from the Courtroom feature, which documents unusual occurrences in the courtroom, such as dissents from the bench. He's a contributing writer to Education Week, where he's covered education issues in the Supreme Court and in the lower courts for more than 25 years, and has previously served as Washington editor of Education Week, where he supervised coverage of federal and education policy matters, as well as the 2004 and 2008 presidential and congressional elections. He's studied political science at Georgetown University and lectured at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Um, And again, it's an honor to have him with us. Yeah, I think these two speakers will offer two different perspectives on the court that will really help to frame the rest of this conference. So with that, um, over to you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Cole, for that very kind introduction. For what it's worth, I agree with the description that Scott gave of um, Nicholas as a 21st century superhero. And on top of all that Scott describes that Nicholas somehow manages to accomplish, he's also somehow able to be a very dear and supportive friend to those around him and an excellent academic collaborator. It's also a privilege to be here and speak alongside the very talented Mark Walsh. Thank you to the UVU Center for Constitutional Studies and uh, my friend Scott Paul. I'm very excited about all that you're doing. So it's a pleasure to be with you today to talk about a really interesting topic, religious liberty at the Supreme Court. I wish I could be here with you all in Utah in person. I have a lot of fond memories in Utah. It's been, a, it's been a wild ride at the Supreme Court the last few years. We've had it all. <clears throat> Blockbuster opinions, a presidential impeachment trial, a global camp pandemic forcing the court to close and arguments to go online. And we've even had a stray toilet flushing captured on the recording at the Supreme Court. So it's been uh, an interesting few years for the justices who like the nation they serve are often divided on on important questions dealing with chaotic circumstances. But what do their recent opinions in the religious liberty arena show us? I'll suggest today that this may be one area in the law where the justices seem to be weaving together a set of precedents that could nurture some long-term peace for our country. The court's recent religious liberty decisions have touched on a wide range of subjects. Teachers at religious schools, religious exemptions from federal mandates, state constitutional provisions rooted in anti-Catholic bigotry, the so-called shadow docket where we have dealt with recent COVID cases, but all of the court's religion related decisions have harmonized around a principle that despite our honest and deep-seated differences and our disagreements about important questions, robust protection for religious dissenters is essential to our living together, living alongside each other in peace in a pluralistic society. There are three topics I'll cover briefly today as I discuss the Supreme Court's precedent. First, a look in the rearview mirror to see what are some of the topics they've covered recently. Second, um, some discussion of what has been termed the court's shadow docket, which means cases coming up to the court on an emergency basis. And third, what do we have on the horizon to look forward to in this um, current Supreme Court term? So first, looking back, The courts move towards anchoring a pluralistic approach within the religious liberty space as part of a long-term trend. Just a a few terms ago, an American Legion versus American Humanist Association, a seven-member majority on the Supreme Court emphasized that, quote, 
The religion clauses of the Constitution aim to foster a society in which people of all beliefs can live together harmoniously, end quote. End quote. So the court's first discussion of religious liberty, um, I'll talk about in the rearview mirror, came in a decision called Bostock versus Clayton County, in which the court interpreted Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act to prohibit employment discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. <clears throat> in the course of responding to religious liberty arguments in that case, the court acknowledged that applying this rule to religious employers, many of whom have deeply held beliefs related to sex and marriage, could be problematic. The court explained that the Constitution's free exercise clause lies at the heart of our pluralistic society, and the justices were deeply concerned about preserving the promise of the free exercise of religion. The court also pointed out Title VII's express statutory exemption for religious organizations and the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which the court said operates as a kind of super statute, displacing the normal operation of other federal laws. In Our Lady Guadalupe, Guadalupe School versus um, Maurice Baru, this concerned uh, something called the ministerial exception, which is rooted in both religion clauses, the free exercise clause and the establishment clause. There, the Supreme Court in uh, another seven to two majority ruled that non-discrimination laws like the, Anti the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Age Discrimination and Employment Act can't constrain the freedom of religious groups to choose their leaders and to choose the teachers who will pass on the faith to the next generation. This is true even if the school doesn't rely on overt religious titles. There was some discussion at oral argument and briefing about the fact that if the court limited this sort of protection just to uh, religious organizations that referred to teachers or, or leaders as ministers or priests, what this would do is have a marginalizing effect on religious minority groups like Muslim groups that don't use those sort of titles, that, that sort of hierarchical idea is more anathema to their religious beliefs. And so the importance of having a protection for religious organizations and their ability to, to have leadership <clears throat> in a way that was more inclusive and recognized more uh, of the diversity in our pluralistic nation, I think was a good thing. In the next case, Espinoza, the court touched on a, and dealt with a statute in Montana that excluded religious schools from participating in public programs that would provide scholarships for kids going to kids, going to school. The state provision was part of a wave of what's known as Blaine Amendments, many of which were originally enacted in the 1800s as a way of keeping Catholic immigrants from setting up their own school systems when they immigrated to our country. And, and at that time, as a way of um, sort of trying to prop up the then very Protestant nature of the public school system. The Supreme Court rejected the Blaine Amendments as something born of bigotry and having a shameful pedigree. The court talked about how these amendments have led to discrimination that are condemned by the First Amendment. Espinoza is a powerful victory for pluralism in both historical and present day terms because um, these, these were historically basically created to force an immigrant minority to conform to the majority's religious and cultural views. And in, and in modern terms, these amendments are being used in Montana and elsewhere to tell religious groups they must relinquish their religious character as a prerequisite of equal participation in society. Espinoza rejects both the historical provenance and the modern usage of these sorts of laws. And it precludes these sorts of government imposed um, requirements as odious to our constitution. So now moving to the court's shadow docket, uh, there have been two major different types of cases we've seen in this arena. Uh, in, in recent times. So one has been the court dealing with executions with prisoners on death row who would like to have their spiritual advisor or spiritual leader with them in their final moments. <clears throat> and we've moved from the court in 2019, rejecting these sorts of requests based on timeliness grounds to um, just as recently as earlier this year, a case where the court said that um, other states seem to be able to find ways to allow death row inmates to have their spiritual advisor with them during their final moments. And so uh, the, the states who were unwilling to do so, the court said, you know, 
basically suggested ought to take a harder look at whether or not they, they could be more accommodating towards religion. I think this is an important reminder that even in prison, even for inmates on death row, human dignity matters. Protecting the ability of people with a diversity of religious views matters and to have a, a range of different types of religious leaders who can be in the, in the chamber for those final moments, the court is willing to be cautious about protecting these sorts of rights. Of course, another area that you know, will sound familiar to all of us is the court's cases that they've dealt with recently dealing with COVID, something that has been on all of our minds in this last year. It's interesting to think about now as we're in March of 2021, as we uh, consider all of the anniversaries from just a year ago, probably around this time of year, maybe the last time we gave a stranger in public a hug, um, we'll, we'll never watch TV shows with crowds of people together the same way ever again. And why don't we all wish we would have invested more in big tech at this time? Uh, no one could have predicted all the twists and turns that the pandemic was going to bring. It has taught us a lot about viruses, masks, vaccines, travel bans, and, and more about remote work than we ever thought. And uh, what a blessing and a miracle that the vaccine is here in different forms and that it's um, becoming more and more available. But a year of COVID has also taught us a very important lesson about liberty and the role of courts protecting our rights. This has been particularly true in the area of religious liberty because the pandemic brought us something else the country has never seen before. Widespread government orders forbidding attendance at houses of worship. Although most churches, synagogues and mosques and other houses of worship voluntarily closed early on in the pandemic, eventually many had to write, fight for their first amendment right to resume worship activities. As a result, in um, just over a year, we've had, we've had many different federal and state religious liberty lawsuits filed and related to these COVID lockdown orders. The arc of these cases from the early days in the pandemic until now teaches an important lesson about the role of courts in protecting constitutional rights, even in emergencies. When courts simply defer to governments about the need to restrict liberty, then governments are more likely to restrict liberty. Worse, sometimes government will favor interests that they think are important or valuable or essential and restrict rights that they don't view as important. <clears throat> Um, but when courts scrutinize government's claims, when they ask questions and require support before allowing government to restrict liberty, then constitutional rights are far more secure. Uh, this is something that um, I'll, I'll discuss a little bit more later, but that Professor Cass Sunstein has also written about recently. So um, these COVID religious liberty cases demonstrate a lesson playing out over the past year. Early in the pandemic, courts were quite deferential to governors and mayors when they said that they needed to ban in-person worship. This issue reached the Supreme Court for the first time last May in a case called South Bay Pentecostal Church versus Newsom. There, Chief Justice Roberts explained that COVID restrictions were subject to reasonable disagreement and that governments should get especially broad latitude not to be second guessed by judges. As a result of this deferential approach, governments won virtually all of the cases about closing houses of worship. Um, in response to these deferential rulings, <clears throat> some, some governments felt emboldened to play favorites, to focus on allowing segments of the economy to open that were going to generate more tax revenue and uh, to show indifference and sometimes outright hostility towards religious groups that wanted to exercise their First Amendment rights. Nevada, for example, allowed people to sit right next to each other gambling at a craps table, but wouldn't allow religious gatherings. New York's governor, Andrew Cuomo, targeted his COVID orders in ways that um, there was actually a map with red lines that mapped pretty closely onto the neighborhoods of Orthodox Jewish communities. There was actually a press conference where some of the political folks in, in this Governor Cuomo's administration were describing the purpose for a new, very restrictive policy that would limit in-house worship to, to just 10 people as a flat cap, even if the cathedral could seat a thousand. When they were describing the purpose for these new restrictions, they held up uh, a photo of Orthodox Jewish individuals at a funeral and said, this is, this is the problem that we're trying to solve. 
Um, the only problem with that is that their photo was a decade old um, and didn't, didn't have anything to do with <clears throat> what was actually going on in New York at the moment. In fact, some of the neighborhoods that were being targeted for this more restrictive treatment had lower or COVID rates than nearby neighborhoods that didn't have as high of an Orthodox Jewish population that were not subject to the same sort of restriction. <clears throat> so for a while, governments got away with this, um, receiving extra deference from courts and trusting that that would allow them to restrict rights selectively rather than in an even handed way without facing any sort of serious judicial scrutiny. But eventually uh, the courts caught up. The key turning point was a pair of Supreme Court rulings around Thanksgiving last year. And the court ruled in favor of synagogues and churches challenging Governor Cuomo's restrictions in New York. This is a case, um, in addition to being an associate professor of law at Notre Dame, I also direct the Religious Liberty Initiative there. And students worked on an amicus brief that we had the chance to file in some of these cases representing Muslim individuals who wrote about, you know, we know as Muslims in New York what it feels like to be targeted during times of fear and anxiety and to be kind of essentially the scapegoat um, when government officials are trying to find someone to blame. And so we're standing up to defend our Jewish neighbors because we don't think that that's right for government to be able to do that to them now. So in this ruling by the Supreme Court, the court said that the government hadn't offered sufficient proof for why it needed to restrict worship so much for these houses of worship, but, was, but not for neighboring other neighborhoods and also not for places like liquor stores or bike shops or places to go in and get acupuncture done. The court found it hard to believe that the prohibited religious worship would create a more serious health risk than many other activities that the state allowed. Uh, Professor Cass Sensting has written about how this decision it can be described as our anti-Koromatsu. Um, and Koromatsu was a case where around World War II, Courts deferred to government when government officials said that it was important for national security and public safety to put individuals of Japanese ancestry in, um, in camps around the United States and to take them from their homes because of potential threats to our national security. And for sure, the, the facts are different and the, the racial issues that were going on in Korematsu are particularly egregious. But um, Professor Sunstein's point is that Courts have a choice in the face of public uncertainty and, and fear. They can give government a blank check, and then later, in hindsight, we often come to regret those incidents in history when we were not protective enough of religious or of, of individual rights. Or courts can ask government for proof and require government to act in an even-handed way. And that's what I submit the court required in this COVID case. It turned out later that. Um, the New York Times ran a, a piece where some of the public officials in New York had resigned because they were being asked to um, create policies that weren't really driven by the evidence. This, this February um, article just from this last year, the New York Times said that the public health officials, um, quote, often found out about major changes in pandemic policy only after Governor Cuomo announced them at a news conference and then asked them to match their health guidance to the announcements, end quote. Um, these, these officials talked about how they were not deeply involved in decisions where the political actors were deciding who to restrict and how much <clears throat> with the new policies New York was rolling out. Which is another reason why it's important for courts to ask questions about how did we arrive at this policy uh, that the court has unveiled or that the government has unveiled, is it really a policy driven by evidence and aimed at public safety or is it something else? What happened next after these cases should not be forgotten. Once the courts began requiring some proof from government for its restrictions, those restrictions and the public health claims on which they're based began to fall apart. And in a, a stream of other cases that have come up to the Supreme Court dealing with COVID cases, most of them lost. Some people have pointed to Justice Barrett's addition to the court as the decisive reason for this change. But it's important to remember in those Thanksgiving cases, um, the Diocese of Brooklyn and Agadath Israel cases, the Chief Justice Roberts uh, ruled in, in favor of religious liberty on the merits. He had questions about timing, which is why he would have ruled uh, in favor of the government on that basis. 
but on the merits, he agreed the government has gone too far. And in subsequent cases, he has continued to rule on the merits, requiring more proof from government now that more proof is available. The last thing that I'll touch on is that these decisions we've discussed in Bostock and Espinoza and Our Lady, you know, these COVID cases, they show what I believe to be a court systematically building precedent on a foundational idea that religious freedom can help people in a diverse pluralistic society to live together in peace, even amid disagreements over fundamental issues. Properly understood religious liberty protections can help society avoid zero sum disputes in which one side of a polarized debate must win a complete victory where the other side must be vanquished or excluded from society. Although the justices don't always agree on the application of these principles in a particular fact scenario, they do have large agreement on these principles themselves, which I think is good for both society um, and the court. So one of the cases uh, in, that might be most consequential in this regard coming up this current term that the court has yet to decide is Fulton. This case presents issues of profound consequence, not just for religious foster care and adoption providers, which is the context in which this case arises, but also for the meaning of the free exercise clause. This case involves Catholic social services of Philadelphia and some foster families who um, are the, the plaintiffs in this lawsuit. Catholic social services has pioneered care for orphans and, and um, foster care in the city. The city has described them as a leading light, has ranked them as one of the top agencies in the city. And this agency serves over 70% of the children it takes care of are black or minority children, and most of the families it serves are as well. CSS, Catholic Social Services, has been doing this work for more than a century, and, um, and it partners with families who have, um, some of them been award-winning foster parents. But in 2018, city officials began using their monopoly power over foster care to exclude CSS and the foster parents like Sharon L. Fulton and Tony Sims Bush who work with them from taking in more foster children, even at the same time that the city recognized that they had a shortage of over 300 um, beds and, and foster parents needed to care for children who were in group homes that should not be in group homes. When children don't find a, a foster family and a, a permanent family to care for them and they What's, what happens is it's called the age out of foster care without finding that family. The odds are stacked so high against these kids um, and you know, are very high that they're going to end up dealing with addiction, back on the street, um, with abuse, not pursuing an education, and, and perpetuating this vicious cycle. So, and disproportionately, it is um, black and minority children who are likely to suffer this fate when we don't have enough families, when we don't have enough um, agencies helping recruit those families. The Supreme Court is hearing this case this term, not just decide to decide whether Philadelphia's actions violate the First Amendment, but also deciding whether it might revisit some precedent uh, that will govern how much in general we have a presumption in favor of government trying to work to accommodate religious beliefs and to find solutions to accomplish government goals that are more protective of religious beliefs. By next summer, we may well look back in appreciation on these recent terms as a time when broad majorities of the court made clear, despite storms raging of class political landscapes and the chaos of the pandemic, that a robust understanding of religious liberty can be an essential peacemaking mechanism, one that offers the prospect of de-escalating the culture wars and truly preserving a society in which people of all beliefs can live together harmoniously. Thank you. Well, um, thanks Scott and uh, thanks Nicholas for that nice introduction and, and Stephanie for uh, uh, an excellent presentation. Um, uh, as Stephanie says, it's, it's been a tumultuous year for the court uh, with the pandemic and, and uh, the death of Justice uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And now with uh, Justice Amy Coney Barrett uh, joining the court, it, it's a new court. Uh, uh, Justice Byron White uh, used to say that with each new edition, uh, you have a new court, it's, it's a different dynamic. I started covering the court in 1991 uh, when Justice White was still on the court and, and covered a couple terms with him. And so I'm gonna come back to that, uh, that year a little later. Um, uh, the, the pandemic has meant a lot of changes for how the court does its work. Um, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward uh, to Stephanie, uh, perhaps seeing her around the building next uh, term as she's a clerk 
and uh, uh, hopefully uh, the building will reopen to the public and get back to normal. Um, uh, and, and not that uh, uh, justice, uh, the justices clerks uh, have a lot of interaction with the, the reporters, they, they don't, but, uh, but hopefully we'll, we'll see around the building. Uh, uh, so um, uh, I'm, I'm a bit more of a uh, visual learner and a visual presenter. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit uh, share screen here. Uh, so I'm going to uh, uh, start on a little bit of a light note to hear um, uh, the justices. They've been just like us. Uh, they've been going on Zoom, uh, not for their oral arguments, but uh, but in appearances uh, before students and in law schools and stuff like that. And um, uh, I'll just uh, cycle through some of these. Justice uh, Chief Justice Roberts delivered uh, a remote uh, graduation address last spring to his uh, son's high school uh, commencement. Uh, and this was just about the time the court was starting its telephone arguments and, and the chief had a great quip. He said, people were asking him whether uh, they were gonna you know, participate in these telephone arguments uh, by wearing their robes. And uh, he said he wasn't sure if the, those folks meant judicial or bath. Um, Justice Gorsuch, uh, uh, you know, addressed uh, middle school students uh, last fall, was uh, just before the court term opened, and he had his uh, pandemic uh, beard. Justice Sotomayor has uh, uh, made uh, several appearances, and um, Justice Breyer was really the first to go, as he called it, on the Zoom with uh, some high school students last spring, and uh, has made quite a few appearances. And I've, I've been telling people he's been quite uh, adept, although Judge uh, Griffith, who we're gonna hear from later in the, the conference was telling me that, uh, that Justice Breyer did have some difficulty with the uh, mock trial, the mock Shakespeare trial uh, in a recent Zoom uh, appearance. Um, but uh, Justice Breyer's favorite spot for doing his um, uh, Zooms were, is from his bedroom in his house in Cambridge, uh, where uh, sometimes you see uh, Mrs. Breyer kind of uh, traipsing through in the background and um, some you know judges have told lawyers that uh, that a bedroom is not an appropriate place to uh, to appear for for court appearance but I say you know if a, if a Supreme Court justice can do it uh, and, and at least the bed is made so now um, Justice Barrett uh, the newest member of the court has joined the trend uh, just uh, uh, last month, she appeared before uh, students at Athens Academy in Georgia. It's a little hard to tell, and they, did, they didn't release the video, but that's her in the bottom frame on the, the screen there. And um, I, I'm going to have to have a, a quick chat, though, with the, uh, the reporter at the Oconee Enterprise, uh, uh, who, who identified uh, Barrett as having clerked for Justice Samuel Alito. And we know that's not right. Now, during her confirmation hearing, um, um, Judge Barrett told a nice little story, then Judge Barrett, uh, about a conversation uh, she had had with the, with the justice that she did clerk for uh, about the First Amendment uh, and the religion clauses. So I'm going to play that. Could you just talk a little bit about the Establishment Clause generally, with not in regard to any particular set of facts, but sort of what the, what the courts over time have tried to do to... to uh, to enforce the mandate of the Constitution? Well, Senator Cornyn, when I interviewed for my job with Justice Scalia, he asked what area of the court's precedent that I thought you know, needed to be uh, better organized or that sort of thing. And off the cuff, I said, well, gosh, the First Amendment. And he said, well, what do you mean? And I fell down a rabbit hole of trying to explain without success, because it is a very complicated area of the law, um, how one might see one's way through the thicket of balancing the Establishment Clause against the Free Exercise Clause. It's a notoriously different, difficult area of the law. And to the extent that you know there is tension in the court's cases, um, and I'm giving you no better an answer, I assure you, than I did to Justice Scalia that day, it's been something that the court has struggled with, you know, for decades to try to come to a sensible way to apply both of those clauses. Now, uh, uh, despite her modesty there, I, I, I think uh, uh, Judge Barrett was very sharp in, in uh, the hearing and, and my colleague uh, on the Supreme Court beat, Adam Liptak of the, the New York Times uh, agreed uh, with, and he had an assessment that I thought might kind of resonate with uh, those of you who, who teach law. Um, 
you know, with only minor stumbles, Judge Barrett showed the sure command of the law one would expect from someone who'd spent the bulk of her career teaching it. Her demeanor by turns patient and prickly was that of a professor unlucky enough to find herself teaching a seminar to a particularly dim set of students. Now, I'm sure Adam was not referring to uh, your Senator from Utah um, when, when he, he made that comment, but here's Senator Lee uh, asking uh, Barrett about uh, one of the religion cases that Stephanie discussed, the Espinoza uh, case uh, involving uh, uh, aid to uh, religious schools. Uh, thankfully, earlier this year, the Supreme Court in, in Espinosa versus Montoya Department, uh, Mon Montana Department of Revenue, struck down, uh, uh, struck uh, uh, another blow against Blaine Amendments by re reinforcing uh, their earlier decision in the Trinity Lutheran case. Would you discuss briefly with us the Supreme Court's recent jurisprudence on this issue regarding Blaine Amendments and how they, uh, how they intersect with religious freedom? Sure. So the Supreme Court's recent decisions um, get at the principle that while, you know, the we have to be careful about the Establishment Clause, right? So there's a line of cases saying, you know, a, a state or a federal government clearly can't establish a church. And so we have a line of cases about what that means. But at the same time, Espinoza um, being an example, the court has been free, uh, very clear that religious institutions can't be discriminated against or excluded from public programs simply because they are religious. So, uh, you know, I thought just uh, Judge Barrett that was, was showing some comfort with the Espinoza decision and uh, uh, she had uh, on the Seventh Circuit participated in a panel um, that had ruled really kind of the same way uh, as the court ruled in the Guad Our Lady of Guadalupe case on the ministerial exception. Um, so uh, Barrett is confirmed and with da within days uh, uh, of taking her oaths, she is on the court to hear arguments in uh, an important uh, free exercise clause on, on the merits docket. And that's the one that uh, Stephanie was just describing, uh, Fulton versus city of Philadelphia about uh, the city's ex uh, exclusion of Catholic social services uh, from uh, essentially from participating in the foster care system uh, because the Catholic agency declines to uh, certify same sex parents. And um, uh, uh, Stephanie mentioned the employment division Smith, which is uh, one of the questions in this case, whether that should be overruled. And I, I, I think the next panel in this uh, conference is going to uh, address, I mean, I know it's going to address employment division versus Smith and, and may uh, look into that question, but I'll just uh, show you a couple of the questions that uh, uh, Judge Barrett asked in her, uh, for, in, in, that was not her first oral argument, but in the uh, argument in that case. Um, you know, you argue in your briefs that Smith should be overruled, but you, you could win, and this is to uh, the lawyer for Catholic Social Services, uh, you, you win even under Smith. So why should we entertain the idea of whether to overrule Smith? And then she asks, you know, what would you replace Smith with? Would you want to go back to Sherbert versus Vernier? And, and some of the other justices uh, addressed uh, the question of overruling Smith, but I, uh, you know, my sense was at, at the end of that argument that the court did not uh, feel that the majority of the court did not necessarily think it was uh, needed to overrule employment division versus Smith in this case. Uh, to rule for uh, Fulton and Catholic Social Services, which was kind of the uh, consensus that they're going to find some way to, to rule for Catholic Social Services. Um, so then uh, again, Stephanie gave us some, some great examples about the shadow docket, and this is where we're going to overlap a little. I just have a, a few slides here, uh, and maybe this will, you know, help, help um, uh, I think people who follow the court uh, know what the shadow docket means, and but maybe some of our high school students and the younger folks um, just can under, better understand the distinction between the court's merits docket, where it says these are the cases we're going to really look into, and then there are a lot of briefs. Um, there are briefs in cases on the shadow docket too, but but these are things that are are more of a, an emergency basis and. Um, uh, there you see Will Bode of the University of Chicago Law School. He's a former clerk to Chief Justice Roberts, and he kind of coined the phrase in this uh, 2015 
a law review article, but the shadow docket itself has been around for a long time. It, it involves all kinds of emergency uh, measures and, and uh, motions and, and you know, death penalty appeals are the, the classic one. But in the last year, uh, Stephanie said we've seen uh, um, uh, some uh, cases uh, involving uh, ministers on death row, uh, COVID cases, uh, lots of cases from the Trump administration dealing with uh, some of their policies and nationwide injunctions against them and so forth. So, um, so I'm also going to go back to uh, May uh, last year on um, uh, to that uh, uh, South Bay uh, United Pe Pentecostal Church versus uh, Newsom. Um, uh, where the Supreme Court, uh, where, uh, you know, California church had sought relief from some of that state's restrictions and the court said no. And uh, the chief uh, justice uh, joined the court's liberal block at, at that time, uh, uh, but then just wrote uh, for himself when he said that our, you know, our constitution principally entrusts the safety and health of the people to the politically accountable officials of the states to guard and protect uh, their broad latitude should not be subject to second guessing by an unelected federal judiciary, which lacks the background competence and expertise to assess public health and is not accountable to the people. Excuse me. So now uh, jump ahead to November and Justice Barrett is on the court uh, and another COVID related case or really cases comes uh, from New York. Uh, city in New York State, um, and this was Roman Catholic Diocese of, of Brooklyn, as well as the Good Israel uh, case, um, uh, challenging uh, the state's uh, occupancy limits. And then just before Thanksgiving, uh, uh, the court was issued a decision. Um, it was actually, you know, by that uh, little-known uh, member of the court, uh, the tenth uh, justice, known as Justice Per Curium. Uh, I've covered the court for 30 years, uh, as I said, and I have yet to meet him or her, uh, uh, this justice per curiam, and, but they, they never complain about taking on an extra writing assignment. Um, so per curiam means by the court. Uh, uh, it's when the court wants to issue an unsigned opinion, and uh, it, it doesn't mean a unanimous uh, decision. Many, many per curiam opinions are not, including this one. Um, uh, it was uh, five to four, and this is where you had a lot of uh, people discussing how the addition of, of uh, Justice Barrett uh, played a decisive role. And um, there were lots of opinions in, in this case, uh, including the opinion uh, by the Chief Justice, uh, who, who uh, you know, may have tempered his views or his approach uh, somewhat from, from the previous uh, spring. So, um, uh, now some more time goes by and uh, we're in February and the, the South Bay case uh, returns. Um, and, and now the Supreme Court enjoins uh, some California prohibition, prohibitions on indoor church services, uh, but stops short of uh, blocking a 25% uh, uh, capacity limit uh, on those services. And it, it, it refuses to enjoin uh, the state's ban on singing or chanting uh, during indoor services. Uh, and this is where we uh, see uh, Justice Barrett's uh, very first opinion in a, a written opinion in a case and uh, uh, her first opinion in a, in a merits case came about a month later. But, um, uh, but in this opinion, she says she agrees with Justice uh, Gorsuch's statement. Uh, and, and Justice Gorsuch said he, uh, California was singling out religion for worse treatment than uh, uh, similar uh, secular activities, uh, but uh, but they kind of part company on on the issue of singing, um, and that's where uh, Gorsuch suggested that the, the entertainment industry in California had an exemption from the singing ban, and, um, uh, and 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 it seemed to him that once again we have a state playing favorites with certain uh, industries or sectors uh, of the economy during the pandemic, and and as, as uh, Stephanie mentioned that uh, there had been a case from Nevada, which uh, uh, from some churches and were challenging uh, Nevada's restrictions and casinos seemed to be the favored um, uh, sector in Nevada for obvious reasons. Uh, in her opinion, uh, uh, Justice Barrett explained that she didn't think the churches had met their burden of establishing, establishing their entitlement to relief from the singing ban. And, um, and, and we're still in February here, and uh, 
Uh, and now to go to one of the other types of uh, shadow docket cases that, that Stephanie mentioned uh, involving uh, prisoners, not your typical uh, death row uh, last minute uh, appeal, um, but this one involving uh, uh, prisoners seeking to have their pastors or spiritual uh, leaders present uh, when the death sentence is carried out. Uh, as Stephanie mentioned, there have been a few of these in the last year. Some of those claims have been based on the free exercise clause, but uh, Mr. Smith's in this case was based on uh, under our lupa, uh, the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act. And uh, here the court denied an application by the state of Alabama uh, to, to vacate or throw out an injunction that was in the prisoner's favor by a lower court. And, and Justice Barrett joins the liberal bloc uh, in an opinion by Justice Kagan, uh, which uh, concurred in, in the court's action. And uh, Justice Kagan said uh, uh, Alabama's policy of excluding all clergy members from the death chamber substantially burdens Smith's exercise of religion. But that's just for justices uh, uh, Justice Kagan, Justice Sotomayor, Justice Breyer, Justice uh, Barrett signing on to that opinion. Um, so somewhere there's at least one more uh, vote uh, for the outcome in that and, and, and possibly even uh, 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 possibly four more votes because uh, Justice Thomas was the only one who would have granted uh, the state's application. Uh, and that's one of the criticisms of the shadow docket is that it's, uh, it it's, uh, lacks transparency. So uh, just one more headline uh, out of that, uh, where people are starting to say that uh, here's Judge Justice Barrett flashing her independence and uh, uh, the second uh, little line there, early votes signal Barrett may be harder to peg than predicted. And um, so some of these votes are starting to cause some consternation in conservative quarters. Uh, the Washington Times here in DC is a pretty conservative paper and um, uh, says, Supreme Court Justice Amy Coney Barrett, who is billed as a jurist in the mold of the late conservative uh, uh, Justice Antonin Scalia, is raising eyebrows with uh, early rulings in which she sides with the high court's moderates. Uh, Justice Barrett appeared to break with her mentor, Scalia, for whom she clerked when she joined the moderates and liberals on the bench in, in rejecting a, a, a Trump challenge to Pennsylvania's election laws and leaving in place uh, some COVID-19 restrictions. We didn't get into election law cases because they're not really uh, about the religion clauses. Um, so I think it may be a bit early to draw some of those kinds of conclusions on some pretty uh, thin evidence. Um, and, and as I mentioned, I, I started covering the court in 1991 and uh, I, I uh, was doing some recondo on some boxes of mine I came across during quarantine last spring, and I was kind of saving everything from when I first started the court, including some uh, just news clips about, uh, you know, the, the court. And this was a time when uh, Justice David Souter was uh, completing his first term. So here's one of those clips. It says uh, the Wall Street Journal, a friend of mine, Stephen Wormiel. That Souter becomes a consistent, though independent, vote for the conservative bloc, uh, and that's in his first term. And in uh, the first column, there is, um, uh, you know, conservatives pleased. And um, in the New York Times, Linda Greenhouse had kind of the same theme that uh, Souter helped uh, solidify the conservative majority. But I think with some prescience, she did say that uh, Souter remains a mystery. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Justice Souter did uh, end up uh, uh, becoming a, a pre pretty reliable member of the uh, liberal uh, block of the court uh, to, to the uh, concern of, of uh, those who uh, had, had uh, helped appoint him and, and, and conservatives. Um, but I do think it's just, it's just uh, need to be wary about uh, drawing conclusions, even at the end of a full term, and we're not even there yet. So. I'm going to conclude with uh, just one more very short clip from uh, uh, Judge Barrett's uh, confirmation hearing. Uh, this is a First Amendment conference, uh, so uh, this is Senator Ben Sass asking her about the five freedoms of the First Amendment. Um, what are the five freedoms of the First Amendment? Speech, religion, press, assembly, Speech, press, religion, assembly. I don't know, what am I missing? Redress or protest. Okay. Um, 
So that was not to pick on uh, uh, Judge Barrett, but uh, those, uh, those are long uh, um, uh, hearings and uh, uh, I'm trying to figure out how to stop share here, but um, uh, the, um, just that uh, perhaps the, you know, the, the sometimes forgotten uh, uh, fifth freedom would be a good subject for the First Amendment uh, Center's uh, next uh, conference, uh, for re petition to redress the government. Thank you both very much indeed. We've, we've just got a few minutes for questions. And, uh, and if you do have questions you'd like to ask, do, do ask them in the YouTube channel. Um, I'm, I'm going to gather a few together. Um, but there's, there's, there's one first, first question, which I think is, is quite interesting about the, the nature of problems that the court can solve. So, so one, of our, uh, one of the students watching, I think, asks, while it's not a mandatory program, Within Utah, students from the ninth to twelfth grade have the ability to opt into an LDS class program to learn more about their church's views and to read scripture. As far as I'm aware, other churches do not have the same opportunity. Do you see this as something that may one day end up in the courts? I, I don't know, um, <laughs> Mark or, or Stephanie, whether um, maybe well, Stephanie wants to jump in. I'll, I'll just say I'm. I, uh... I'm not a lawyer, so I don't take anything I say as legal advice. Um, uh, th there have been uh, cases about um, voluntary, you know, release of public school students for um, religious instruction, um, and the court has, you know, been okay with that uh, under the First Amendment. And I don't know if exactly if that's the parallel that this uh, student is is suggesting, and and the fact that if they're only available. For one and faith and not another, um, I'm not sure that that's a constitutional problem. Um, for a non-lawyer, Mark, you know more about the Supreme Court and First Amendment than a lot of lawyers I know, so it's pretty impressive. Um, I agree that the court has had cases suggesting that voluntary release from, from schools are, are not problematic. My understanding of how it works in Utah is that this is a, a voluntary release program where students go to seminary um, for the Church of Jesus Christ of LDS of, of Latter-day Saints or other other sorts of gatherings for other religious groups. I don't think that only that church can do it. So it would be a problem, I think, if the school said only people who <clears throat> are members of that church can have release time, but nobody else can, because then we'd be starting to show preference between religious denominations. And that um, does run into some long-standing and long-understood problems under both clauses of the, both religion clauses of the First Amendment. Thank you both. And, and then in the interest of time, I'm, I'm going to gather up, we've had several questions about specific cases, but I think a common theme that's emerging from them is in, in as, as, as far as you can both tell, looking at the sort of early moves of this new court and the composition has of course changed very much in the, in the last few years. Do you anticipate that the, the rulings in this area of religious freedom are going to be more in the realm of incremental change and, and sort of tidying up uh, approach to controversies, or do you see or expect, um, you know, a, a significant departure to, to what previous courts might have done? Well, I'm hearing a I'm, I'm hearing a pause from <laughs> Stephanie. Maybe because you, you you take this one first, Mark. Go ahead. Going to be in the building uh, next year as some of these cases come along. Uh, I mean, the court you know takes the cases that come to it, uh, but the court also sends signals about what kinds of cases maybe you should try to bring to us, and that it has done that in in uh, uh, in the area of, of religion and with a number of uh, uh, things. So um, it, it's been you know. Uh, just a, a court that has been interested in, in religious liberty and expanding and, and um, seeing some, some issues that need to be addressed. And so um, uh, I think in general, Supreme Court cases that the, the court does go uh, for, uh, go smaller when it can. Um, but, but, you know, as we discussed, you know, if, if the court were to to uh, reconsider and overrule a, a, a big precedent like employment division versus Smith, that would be uh, that would be on the larger scale. One small thing I'll add is that um, 
in a, in a lot of cases in this area, you know, you, you may not hear about this in the news as much, but there are surprising broad margins on some of these rulings. So the, the ruling in the American Legion case dealing with religious symbols in public and the recent ruling um, that was dealing with titles of religious leaders when we're giving the ministerial exception, which, which in and of itself was, was building on about a decade old ruling that was a unanimous decision. <clears throat> so that doesn't mean that they're all easy cases, but I think that there's more consensus in these areas already than one might think. And so, you know, the, the addition of another justice certainly adds new dimensions, but I don't think it's gonna radically change that fact that it has already been existing in this space in a number of contexts. Um, I think we've got time for for one last question, and it, it follows on so uh, so nicely from what Stefan has just said. I'll I'll, I'll ask it. The, the um, I think one of the students asked, do you, "Do you think the labels conservative and liberal, when we're describing justices, sort of did disguise a, a proper understanding of their jurisprudence and, and views?" Mark, I like this thing we've got going on. Do you want to go first? <laughs> sure. So. Uh... You know, the court does not like to think of itself in those terms, um, certainly not in political terms, like even of the, the presidents who appointed them and then a lot of controversy about that. Um, but, and there are many, many issues that don't fall neatly into conservative or liberal um, uh, piles. Uh, so, uh, but, but on the other hand, sometimes, you know, they kind of know what's going on in on, on, on some of these big cases. and. And uh, I'm always reminded that Justice Breyer was once uh, giving a talk and just describing uh, some case that had been five four, and he just said, you know, the usual suspects. So um, uh, and that was, you know, the five conservatives were in the majority, and the four more liberal uh, justices were in the minority. Yeah, this is a really great question. I I do think that labeling the justices. With, with really political labels, probably masks uh, more than it reveals when it, when it comes to what's going on with the court. I mean, there are justices, there are difference in the judicial philosophy and approach that the justices take. So for instance, a number of the justices um, think it's really important for jurists to be an originalist, a textualist, which means that you're trying to follow the language of the constitution as, as best you can tell as it was originally understood. We're, we're focusing on what the text of the statute says uh, with rigorous analysis of that text. <clears throat> One thing that um, Justice Gorsuch has written about in Time Magazine is that um, originalism, it should be understood not in big C conservative way, but in like a small C conservative way, meaning to conserve the meaning of the constitution as it was written. Uh, so put another way, originalism is teaching that the Constitution's meaning was fixed by we the people, and, and so unelected judges shouldn't change it. The people should change that meaning. Um, Washington Post's Aaron Blake noted that among conservatives, being originalist is basically code for not being an activist judge, um, it, but among liberals, it's code for being a conservative. So there is some of this tension here. Um, one thing that I think is worth remembering, though, is that this particular judicial approach of textualism or originalism doesn't always lead to right of center outcomes. So for example, in the landmark Brown versus Board of Education decision, this was championed by Justice Hugo Black, one of the, the earliest um, originalists, even though this outcome in Brown versus Board of Education that it was desegregating our schools, this contradicted what one might have expected of Justice Black's personal politics. Uh, Harvard Law School's Noah Feldman described Black as the strongest internal voice on the Supreme Court for ending the separate but equal regime of racial segregation, segregation despite the fact that Justice Black was a former Ku Klux Klan member from the Deep South, and he had, you know, his family faced political ramifications for this ruling. Um, Gorsuch, Justice Gorsuch himself has highlighted instances where originalism leads or should lead to outcomes considered left-leaning, such as upholding protesters' right to burn the American flag, preventing the government from putting a GPS tracking device in your car without a warrant, protecting immigrants from being punished according to too vague of laws. Um, so that's why I think that it's it's more helpful to think about judicial philosophy, another type of philosophy on the other, that other jurists 
views as um, like living constitutionalism or common law constitutionalism. I think those are the more interesting questions to ask about how these justices are approaching these cases. Thank you both very, very much indeed. I see that our time is up and, and Scott has reappeared. So uh, thank you both for a wonderful session. Thank you, Nicholas and Stephanie. Thank you, Mark. To, to, repeat, uh, to repeat, Nicholas, uh, yes, what, what a wonderful session uh, and what an outstanding beginning to our conference.